word and just to know you more, Lord. Um, we just devote this time to you. Help us to be willing, Lord. I am willing. Take everything that I have prepared, Lord, and sift it. Remove anything that is not needed, anything that you do not desire, and leave only what you do desire. Take anything that is missing that I have not included and put it in, Lord. Speak the words through my mouth. I am willing, Lord. Help us to all be willing to receive whatever you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So last week, we looked at another of Jesus' miracles. We saw the healing of a lame man near a pool outside of Jerusalem. It was one of the miraculous signs that was pointing to Jesus' authority over nature and the human body as he immediately healed this man who had been incapacitated for almost 40 years. We saw that many people were amazed and believed, but others seemed to miss the significance of this sign, and they began to argue with Jesus and with the man about whether he had the right to carry his mat or whether Jesus had the authority to do any type of healing work on the Sabbath. So we have this contrast where we see Jesus in this story last week. He asked the lame man, do you want to get well? Or it could be translated, are you willing to receive healing? And because this man is willing, the miraculous physical healing takes place in that moment. Versus this deeper spiritual purpose that Jesus had even beyond this healing, which was to help the people of Jerusalem, especially those religious leaders, see their own desperate need for healing from sin, from pride and self-effort and self-reliance on their human religious customs and their good works. But on this other hand, they did not want to be healed. Those religious leaders were unwilling to see what was on display right in front of them. So Jesus has kicked up quite a stir in Jerusalem at this point. Other gospel accounts confirm that much was happening around this time. Jesus was healing many other people. He had commissioned his disciples to go out two by two to drive out evil spirits and to testify about Jesus. Another thing we learn from the other gospels is that John the Baptist had recently been imprisoned and beheaded for offending the royal family of King Herod. It might even seem that things were getting a bit amped up or even out of control. But God's sovereign plans were at work all over the place, and that is where we land this week. We will see two more signs, and we will see how the people are wowed. But a sign is not meant to be the source of anything great or wonderful. A sign is meant to point to something else, something greater. John recorded these signs about Jesus so that we would believe, his word says, and have life in his name. So the signs we read about this week reveal Jesus' sovereign power. Our big idea, our doctrine, and our aim all deal with the sovereign power of Almighty God and his son Jesus, which is on great display in this lesson. We'll look at two sections, the first, sovereign to satisfy, and then the second, sovereign to save. I can't read that far to read our aim, so let me see if I can see it here. Our aim is that Jesus' sovereign power abundantly satisfies and saves, satisfies and saves all who trust him as Lord. So our first section, we got a problem. Let's look uh, with me, go in your Bibles to John chapter 6, looking at verses 1 through 4. We read that Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. So we've set the scene, understanding that these men had been super busy, on the move, also possibly dealing with grief over the death of a friend. The Mark account of this story gives um, an interesting detail Go with me over, if you can flip over, to Mark chapter 6 real quick. If you flip over to the gospel of Mark chapter 6, verse 33, 32, Jesus says to his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now, the original Greek word or Greek translation says, come apart to a solitary place. So much was happening, so many exciting things, so many stories to share and to tell Jesus about all they were doing. Yet in this moment, we don't read that Jesus says, way to go, or tell them how many more you baptized, or what's that latest attendance count? No, he offers a simple invitation. Come away, come apart with me 
to a quiet place and let's rest. I think it's very important that this detail is at the very beginning of this story. So Jesus offers the invite, and he and the 12 get away to this quiet place, and what happens? Well, we learn in verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he doesn't know what to do, or he knows what to do, but he says to Philip and the disciples, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, we are not often told exactly what Jesus was thinking or feeling, but it's nice that in this moment we know exactly what Jesus was thinking. Look at verse 6. He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Jesus had a plan to bless the thousands coming to him, but he was also planning a special blessing for his disciples. And so it's if he was saying, what should we do? <clears throat> Are you guys paying attention? He's calling their attention. And so we see that we read about these responses of at least two disciples in verses 7 and 8. We see where Philip says, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, finds a boy and he says, here's this boy with a little bit of food, but how far will they go among so many? So we've got two attitudes here. One of this is impossible and the other of, well, we've got a little bit. So the two disciples seem to have an attitude of either complete impossibility or at least scarcity and doubt. But somewhere in this crowd was a little boy who Andrew brought to Jesus, and it seems this little boy must have been willing to share his lunch. We weren't told that explicitly, but the disciples surely didn't think there was any way to feed this crowd. They weren't even trying to come up with a solution. Other gospel accounts tell us that the disciples told Jesus to send the people away, to go get their own food and come back later. They had seen Jesus heal the sick, cast out demons, turn water into wine, but it didn't occur to them in this moment to look for him, to look to him for help to meet this practical need. We can see it clearly now, but we do that all the time in our own lives. We've seen God's faithfulness over and over, his sovereignty over all sorts of situations, and yet we charge ahead with self-reliance or little faith, forgetting to ask for help from the one who has everything we need. One thing I love in this moment, as we look at Philip's response first, is that Philip had this seemingly lack of faith, but that lack of faith did not affect Jesus' response or his plans at all. Nor did Andrew's scarcity mentality. Jesus had a plan, and he still acted to provide and to provide abundantly. In his sovereignty, he had already decided what he was going to do in this moment, and so no amount of doubt or grumbling could derail his unchangeable plans. We see how that plan unfolds in the next verses. Looking at verses 10 and 11, Jesus said, Have the people sit down. They sat down in the grass. It says there were about 5,000 of them, or at least 5,000 men. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. So Jesus has the people sit down, perhaps just to calm the chaos, but perhaps it was so that more of the disciples could see what he was about to do. Perhaps it was so that they could get a better head count of how many were present in order to tell the story accurately as we read it today. But then Jesus pauses for a moment to take the, the loaves and give thanks. He blesses the food, thanking God for the willing little boy and for the small provision of lunch, and also thanking God for the crazy wild multiplication that was about to happen with that little lunch. When we look on at verses 12 and 13, we see when they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. The text is very clear that this, is, this was no small bite or provision, but it was abundant, using phrases like had enough or had as much as they wished. These people ate until they were full. Then Jesus takes the time and the care to gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. Twelve baskets full. I can just see it, likely one basket in the hands of each disciple. 
living proof that even in the moments of life when our spiritual bellies are full and we can't take anything or we can't take in anymore, the things we miss or don't even see in that moment are never wasted. In this moment, we are told in the Gospel of Mark that the disciples who had front row seats to this miracle missed it initially. They could not see what Jesus had done until later. But this miracle was not wasted, and they would eventually see very clearly. And when they did, this story would have such an impact that every single gospel writer would include it in his account about Jesus. The leftover bread was certainly a physical blessing to many people this day, maybe to some of these disciples. But the spiritual leftovers from this miracle have blessed millions of people including you and me today as we read and gain encouragement and know Jesus even more through his story. Now we look also at the response from the crowd in verses 14 and 15. It says that they believed Jesus to be the prophet coming into the world and they intended to make him king by force. So these crowds were amazed, but most were likely only seeing the physical benefit to Jesus. Some of them connected the signs, bread, Uh, to, to manna, pointing back to Moses in the desert and how God provided for the Israelites. And so we think, well, how could they have just missed the spiritual significance? But let's don't be too hard on this crowd or even on the Pharisees when we look at these stories. Um, because time and again, they were missing it. They knew the signs, they were looking for them, yet missing it. But remember, they truly believed the Messiah would come like King David a great political and military ruler, one who would satisfy their earthly desires for comfort and power and full bellies. And that is not how Jesus chose to come to earth. Today, we have the benefit of hindsight to know how the story goes and how it ends, at least up to this point. And so we can see a lot of this and how it comes together, but they could not. It was just so outside of their expectations. But we do this all the time today just in our own way. The notes have a great section this week, and I'm just going to quote him exactly. It says, Most often we do not recognize God's greatest work and highest purposes in the world and in our lives. The freshly fed crowd wanted a king who would meet their needs and fulfill their purposes. A provision-craving, power-hungry world desires to package Jesus and fashion a God it can leverage to their own advantage. Human beings do not have the right or capacity to handle or manage their creator. Nor should we even desire to control a God who is infinitely good and loving. The proper response to Jesus' sovereign control is trust. How will you trust God with what he provides and what he does not provide? And our doctrine this week is all about the sovereignty of God, which is just the supremacy and the power and the authority that God has over all things all created things, including human will. This sovereignty means that nothing can successfully stop any act, event, design, or purpose that God intends to bring about. He is sovereign over everything and everyone, including nations and leaders. No nation does anything that God does not purpose or allow. The ultimate end of the many thoughts and plans of man rests in the will and purpose of God. Scripture is full of examples of this truth, and while it does not give us every single answer as to why, we do see that God is sovereign. We see it in God's plan to build a nation from one family in Genesis, God's plan to save that family through a bunch of messy family drama when Joseph gets sold off into slavery and then becomes a great ruler who rescues Egypt and his family during the famine. We see it when God's in God's plan for the enslaved Israelites in Egypt in Exodus. Jesus speaks about it specifically in Matthew chapter 10. We also see it in God's plans for the early church in the book of Acts. Examples abound from the past, and we even see it at work today. But even for us as believers, the problem comes when we cannot see clearly what God is doing. Our limited understanding and power can blind and frustrate us in the face of this great mystery. Because what God declares to be true is often far from being obvious in our limited experience. 
Hebrews chapter 2 confirms this truth about the mystery of the sovereignty of God. At present, it says, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Why is this? Why does he keep some things from our understanding? One obvious answer is that like parents and our children, God protects us from things that we would not ever be able to carry with our small minds and weak hearts. He does, however, answer our desire to know and understand, not by giving us answers to all our questions, but by giving us himself and his presence. So what are we to do? Well, I believe this truth should humble us and bring us to a place of surrender with all of our questions. One writer sums it up this way, and I really love this application, but he says, imagine a piece of paper with a small circle drawn inside of a much larger circle. The inner circle is the circle of responsibility, and the outer circle is the circle of concern. The circle of responsibility represents the things God has called you to do that you cannot give to anyone else. Your calling that he has placed on your life. The only proper response to the inner circle is to carefully and faithfully obey, trusting God for the empowering grace to do so. But many things in life grab at our attention. They they capture your mind, weigh heavy on your heart, but maybe they're not your responsibility or even within your ability to do or produce anything about them. The only proper way to respond to these concerns is to entrust them to your Lord, who governs them all for his glory and your ultimate good. You can do this because the Bible teaches you that things out of your control are not out of control because of God's ordained plan for all things and his active rule over all things, end quote. So with that inner circle, what do we do? Well, we boldly obey. We depend on God, and we move forward. And with that outer circle, when we hear of these tragic things happening in our world, do we just abandon them and become indifferent? No, we pray and we entrust those things to sovereign God. And we learn as we watch and wait that we serve a God with complete control. And we can trust that his plans are perfect and loving and working and weaving together for a future of goodness and blessing and glory. There's a question in the lesson about different attitudes of the disciples and the little boy. And it's had some application question about, you know, what's your attitude in the face of impossible things? And I had to be really honest. And I was like, well, I usually also have, oh, this is impossible or I have a scarcity mentality, what are we going to do, or let me start making my list of how I'm going to fix it. But then I had to add this, and I said, but when I am willing, I'm just blown away by what God will do when we're willing. Only sovereign God could have authority over that little basket of lunch and do the miraculous multiplication that would allow it to satisfy the hunger of thousands of people. Trusting our sovereign God is the only way to satisfy the needs that we have in our lives, both physical and spiritual. And so that's our first truth. Jesus is sovereign to satisfy our needs with his provision. Jesus is sovereign to satisfy our needs with his provision. Now, I would add that only Jesus is sovereign to satisfy all of our needs. He met the physical needs of the hungry crowd with bread and fish, and he met the spiritual needs of the faith-faltering disciples by allowing them to see and even take part in a miracle they didn't believe could happen or even ask for. He meets our needs every single day. He met our greatest need when he came to live here on earth, to be our rescuer, our savior from sin, and our perfect example for how to live a life set apart for God and with God. So what do you hunger for today? Will you stop counting the impossibilities, lay aside your plans, and start asking God to open your eyes to see him working his plans? How will you trust God with what he provides and what he does not provide? And notice the end of that last verse, verse 15 in this section. It says, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. 
So at the beginning, at the end of this great miracle, we see Jesus withdraw and get away, rest and go and be with God. And he invites his most trusted followers to do the same. This was part of his rhythm, his way of life, his way of being. And I believe it was an example for the disciples and also meant to be intended as an example for us today that the way to find that true, lasting satisfaction is through time apart with Jesus. And so how could you find some time to come apart and be with Jesus in this season of life? He does want to, and he is sovereign to satisfy your soul in a way that only he can do. We look at our next section, which is sovereign to say. We have a few short verses describing a story that's familiar to a lot of us where Jesus walks on the water. We know Jesus um, needs this solitude, some time with God, but he's also desiring for his disciples to see what they've been missing, that he is God in human form, that he is sovereign over all things. So he goes off to the mountain to pray and be with God, and he sends the disciples out ahead of him to cross the lake without him. We learn in verses 16 and 17 uh, a few details about this story. It's evening. It's dark, actually. The disciples get into a boat and set off across the Sea of Galilee toward Capernaum. Jesus is not with them. The wind starts to blow. The water is rough. It sounds like a storm is coming up over the lake. And then there's this interesting detail in verse 19. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles... Other gospel accounts say three to four miles, or they had rowed to the middle of the lake. Did anyone besides me Google how wide the Sea of Galilee is? Well, I learned that it's about eight miles wide at its widest point. It's not as wide on the narrower end, but that's actually the opposite end of where Capernaum is. And so what was the point in including this detail? That they were nowhere near the shore. This was not Jesus walking in some shallow water. Every account of the story is very clear on this detail. And then when we look at the rest of verse 19, it says they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. Many of these disciples were experienced fishermen, so most likely they would not have been terrified of just any old storm. Though in this moment they were probably tired and frustrated from rowing so long against the wind straining and straining, but then here comes Jesus walking on the water. And we read it, we're like, oh, how cool, wow, that's amazing. But if we were to actually see someone in the middle of a storm walking on water, I'm not sure that would be our first response. It says these disciples were terrified. In this moment, Jesus' sovereignty, his glory, his godness is on display, and it is terrifying. This is just one small glimpse of why God chooses to withhold some of his glory and his sovereignty from our full understanding and experience. It will quite literally overwhelm us. This points us back to our doctrine. Even when we say or believe that God is sovereign over creation, it will overwhelm us to see that on full display. And that's what happens here to these disciples. Surely Jesus knew this would happen even before he left the mountainside. And yet I love his response. He doesn't rebuke or abandon them, saying, you missed the last miracle, you feeble-minded doubters. Don't you really believe in me? And now you're missing me, coming to you. I'm God, walking on the water. He doesn't do that. He comes to them, reassures them, comforts them, and says, it's me, don't be afraid. This was all part of his sovereign plan. Look at verse 20, and he says to them, It is I, don't be afraid. That's translated to I am he. The same phrase used in other places where we see Jesus say, I am, in a reference to Jesus proclaiming that he is God, the I am, that common name for the Jewish God Yahweh that called to Moses from the burning bush, the one true God. Who else could walk on the water? Who else could reach them in the middle of the sea when they had left him behind on the mountainside, likely hours before? But in this moment, they recognize him, and they see the meaning behind the sign. And look what happens in verse 21. Then they were willing. 
Some translations say willing to receive. Mine says willing to take him into the boat. It wasn't anything they said or anything they did. It wasn't part of some five-step formula to holiness. It was D, none of the above. It was just the fact that their hearts were willing to receive what he was offering. That's all they could do in the situation because they had zero control or power, probably little to no strength at this point, but they heard Jesus' voice, recognized it, and even though they were terrified, they were willing. And that willingness caused them to take him or receive him into their boat. And then we see the next miracle occur in verse 21. Immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Immediately. Two earthly miracles occur here, and they are that Jesus walks on the water and then delivers the boat to shore immediately. Jesus quite literally saves his friends from the storm in this moment. However, in spite of their previous doubting and fickle faith, he saves them in an even better way by allowing the more important spiritual lesson to shine through. If you'll go back with me again to the Mark chapter 6 account, this is the moment. Mark chapter 6, verse 52 It says, they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. But in this moment, the disciples had to go into the storm to get to a place where they could see clearly. And they are able to see clearly about the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. They're able to see clearly that Jesus is God. And then the Matthew account is found in Matthew chapter 14, verse 32 and 33 says, And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. That was they being Peter and Jesus because Peter jumped out of the boat. But it says, Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And I don't think there's any interpretation necessary for that statement. But all of this because they were willing Willing, to fa- willing in the face of fear, willing in the face of doubt and frustration. You know, I'm so glad that God and his sovereign plans doesn't change his plans based on my fickle feelings. He is still God, still working his plans created before I was even a thought in someone's mind. Nothing I do can change that. Now, sometimes I'm not willing to see it, and it's clear that he won't force us to see the truth about him. Oh, but when we are willing, what amazing things he will do. His sovereign plans will prevail, and our best response is humble submission to receive his presence. So what storm are you facing? Have you been rowing? for a long time. You know, if Jesus is sovereign, we may wonder, why not just cancel the storm before it happens, or why not just take us on a different route so we don't have to go through it? And I'm a slow learner, but I am learning in my life that it's in those storms where we receive that gift of clearer vision to be able to really see and know him more. And I have shared before about my own storm and just a a season of, um, just a dark season in my life um, with postpartum depression, with physical health issues after my daughter was born. And I couldn't get out of the storm, y'all. And I had some good support and some good resources, but it was a hard time. And I rode a long time. And I was tired. And I was tired of being sick and not being myself. But I began to have a desire to know Jesus in a new way, where I wasn't just checking off the list of things I could do for him or checking off how many books I had read or Bible studies I had done, and where I just wanted to be with him and experience him in his word and in his creation. And quite frankly, some of the desires that I had to be able to get to that point were so strange to me. But it was his voice calling to me, and I found such great relief. A friend gave me a book, and in in the book was this line, and I know I shared this last year, but it said, a desire for solitude is a desire for your soul to be with God. 
And my soul was able to be with God, to be with Jesus in a new way. And so I received a gift that I probably wouldn't have ever received had I not gone into that storm. Jesus saved me from my storm, though I had to row for what felt like a really long time. But there was so much blessing in the new way I discovered him during that season. His presence, his love, his provision. There was no major voice from heaven moment or some 180 change visible to everyone around me. But I do know that it gave me some clearer vision and deeper trust, especially when it comes to my questions about the sovereignty of God, especially when it comes to loving others on their spiritual journey and not just insisting that they come along with me on mine. And I know it ignited a deeper desire to spend more time being with Jesus rather than only trying to work for Jesus. These are gifts that I treasure and I want to use well. Jesus saved my faith through my storm, and he allowed it to grow in me a new and beautiful desire for him and his presence. Jesus saved his friends from the storm in this story, not by helping them avoid it, but by coming to them in a powerful way, bringing his presence and using that experience to open their eyes to the face, to sorry, opened their eyes to face the truth that he was the promised Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. He granted them clear vision and grew their faith in him that day. He saved them from that storm, but he secured their faith as he grew it and stretched it. And so our second truth is this, Jesus is sovereign to save and secure us through every storm. Jesus is sovereign to save and secure us through every storm. So what storm are you facing right now? I know some of you are tired. And I can't promise you that your storm will calm down anytime soon. But I can promise you that Jesus will come to you with his presence. And praise God, he doesn't depend on you or me getting our act together or saying like a certain right prayer or words before he comes. Our job is to be willing to receive him. Emmanuel, God with us. Opening our eyes and anchoring our faith as we wait and watch his plans unfold all around us. Every single day. Only when we live like this can we understand the lifelong response of the disciples after Jesus died and rose from the dead because it baffles many people. They're like, what, what, what were, those guys were crazy because they knew who they were following. They echo the words of the psalmist in Psalm chapter 126, verse 3, where it says, the Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. So how will you humbly submit to his plans and receive his presence in the midst of your storm today? Let's pray, and as we pray, um, if you would pray with me just in a posture of submission, just gently opening your hands in your lap to receive whatever it is that God would bless you with today. God, we come before you with humble hearts and open hands, Lord. We do not have all the answers to the problems that we face and the storms that we face in this life, but you do, Lord. You have been faithful throughout the ages. You will continue to be faithful. You have given us many answers and much understanding, but you are alone are God, and we are not. And so when we have hard days or hard seasons and we do not understand, Lord, give us an extra dose of your presence, God. As we have our hands open, Lord, touch our hearts. Let us sense that you are very near. Go with us from here, carrying your presence and your light. Allow us to continue to submit to you this week 
wherever you're calling, wherever you're going, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all have a great week. See you next week.